this is our record that we have trained you. So, but go ahead and print your name and sign the date. And then I'm asking you to put any jobs that you're interested in performing at the food bank. This will stay in our files, but if you, when USDA comes by, this is what we will show them to show that we did train our volunteers. But this will also help me and Kathy to know what jobs you are interested in doing so we can assign people on Saturdays. So there is that one. And then um, this is just a general sign up for a food bank. I listed all of the Saturdays for the next for the rest of the year and through 2017 up to this point. You do not have to know what ones you're doing, but if you would like to go ahead and check which ones you're interested in, then the person that is assigned to remind you about food bank will have that information and they can call and remind you that you were going to help. This is not a commitment. It doesn't mean if you sign here and you don't come that day, we're just going to be extremely angry with you. This just is going to be a guide to help you if you want to go ahead and put it in your calendar now and to help us to know who might be coming when. Um, and if you don't know, just put your name on here so we know you're interested in helping. And you don't have to check any of the names. All right, so the first half of this presentation is mandated by USDA. I have to go through every slide with you. I will go through them as quickly as possible. I know you know most of this information, but we are obligated to do this training. So this is the USDA Food Safe Guide. All right, so how does a food become unsafe? There's biological, physical, and chemical ways it can become unsafe. Common, common contaminants, physical would be wood, metal, glass, paint chips, etc. If we had any of that in the food bank, that could contaminate our food. Chemicals, mainly what we would have would be the uh, clean chemicals or the maintenance chemicals, biological, rodents, that kind of thing. So we have to monitor the food bank for this stuff. That's why we have somebody who comes in and cleans. So we need to make sure that we have proper food safety. Now, a lot of this does not apply to us because we don't open the food. But again, we still have to talk about it because there is still the possibility we could cross-contaminate something. Because we do get things like fresh food in, we do get meats in, and if there's a hole in a packaging, we could still contaminate it. So we need to be careful about what we're doing. Um, use proper hygiene. We Time is a big thing for us, especially when we're dealing with frozen food. That's why we only put so much frozen food out on the table at a time. We don't bag 40 different things because it won't stay frozen, and we need to keep it at that temperature in order to give it out. Um, and then we need to make sure that we are cleaning up after the food. Like, you could not... If this happened, we could not give out anything that was contaminated like that. That would have to go in the trash. And once it went in the trash, we would have to fully destroy it. We cannot just throw food away. We have to destroy the food. If a can is broken, we have to open it up and pour bleach on it. If we have food like that, we put it in the trash can and pour bleach on it. It has to be totally destroyed so that somebody could not get into our garbage can and eat something that is contaminated. <laughs> That is a USDA rule. All right. Uh, temperature controls. Again, we don't want to let food sit out because pathogens can grow on them. Um, we need to be checking our temperatures. Really, we do this. We check our we check our freezers. We don't check the food sitting out because at this time we don't let it sit out long enough for it to be a problem. But if it's if uh, a lot of times Jim or Aaron or myself will kind of wander around and we'll tell you to put things back in the freezer for that reason, if it looks like it's becoming um, unfrozen. Or if something that was, at the end of the day, if something is no longer frozen, it must go in the trash. So like, the, I know there's some orange juices that got left out, those are trash. Once they've been frozen, we have to give them out frozen. Uh, don't transfer. So when we stock our refrigerators and freezers, we need to put meats on the bottom fruits and vegetables on the top so that the meat doesn't drip onto the fruits and vegetables because it's not a big deal for the strawberries to drip onto the meat, but if the blood from the meat drips into the strawberries, strawberries are bad. All right, so don't do that. Allergens. This isn't something that has come up before. This is new. Um, and we actually generally don't buy anything with allergens, but we do get things from the USDA that have allergens, mostly nuts, peanut butter. Um, occasionally we'll get bread. But most of that stuff comes from the USDA. However, if you have a client that says they have an allergy, 
notify one, either Kathy, myself, Aaron, Jim, and we will go through and pull things for that. We'll, we will pull specifically for them. Um, so they're not going to have to take home. They do not have to take home something that is an allergen. Um, we, and when we're storing, when we're doing the tables, what's going on? There we go. Uh, we skipped a slide. Anyways, when we're doing the tables, we just have to think about the allergens not being in contact with something else that they could rub off on. Um, again, keep nuts away from fruits and vegetables. That's really the big thing. All right, wash your hands. This is how to wash your hands. Hot water, soap, sing happy birthday in your head. So that's 15 seconds. Wash, and then use paper towels. Um, don't wipe it on your clothing, and we don't have a hand dryer, so that's not an issue. Uh, if there are no paper towels in the restroom, let us know so we can put more in there. When to wash your hands, in case you did not know. Um, oh, no, this is, this is uh, use paper towel to turn off the sink, and you should use a paper towel to open the door. When to wash your hands. Don't touch your, if you're touching sweat, you need to wash your hands. Once you've touched food, wash your hands. Once you touch yourself, you got to wash your hands. If you touch the garbage, you have to wash your hands before you touch the food again. And yet more read things when to wash your hands. Does that <coughs> mean you can't just squirt Purell on your hands? It uh, we can use Purell. If you if if you touch contaminated food, you need to fully wash your hands. If you sneeze, you need to wash your hands. If you brush your skirt, you can put Purell on your hands. I think we, we can use common sense in that in that way. But Purell does not take the place of washing your hands. That's really in, in most situations, it does not. And apparently um, most of our food is either in a can or a package or a box anyway. It is sealed. So it's sealed. It's not like every now and then, like lately, we've had some fresh vegetables and fruits. Yeah. So that's when you really need to be messed with. Yeah, but you should, when you... Either when you get to the food bank, you should wash your hands before you start packaging up the food, just so nothing on your hands gets transferred to the cup, to the cans, or anything. And if you sneeze or cough or something, wash your hands. Um, a lot of this, again, because this is for both food banks and food pan pantries um, and soup kitchens. All well, this doesn't necessarily apply to us, but again, I'm obligated to show you all of these slides. So that is more washing your hands. Never use antiseptic instead of washing your hands. Uh, <laughs> you can use it afterwards. You can, uh, it's, and, and once you do use it, wait for your hands to dry fully. Don't, don't just rub it on when your hands are still wet and start touching stuff, because then it gets on that stuff. All right, and next thing, hand washing sink. Um, so our hand washing sink really is the restroom, the, the restroom in the office. That's what we have at this time. Um, we won't. So we don't want to put anything in front of it, and we don't want to pour any chemicals down that sink. And we don't prep any food in the bathroom. <laughs> it's really important. Um, if the sink is, if the bathroom is missing any of this, hot water, soap, paper towels, and a garbage, let someone know, probably Dave or Aaron, um, and they will go and find those things for you, or they will come back to the church and steal them and take them over to the food bank so that we have that. All right, gloves. We generally don't use gloves, so if we do have to use them for some reason, if uh, this is how you use them correctly, you don't ever blow into a glove. But we don't use them because we don't open up the food. We, excuse me, we cannot portion out food. We have to give it out in the in its packaged containers. The only thing that that the only thing that that rule does not apply to is things like granola balls that are individually wrapped already. So it has all the information on the granola bar. So we can open up a box of granola bars and hand those out. But like, uh, I know at some point in time we had frozen pizza and we had packaged that pizza up. We're no longer allowed to do something like that. We got, fruit? huh? Fruit, we can. We can um, open up those large bags. And that's usually something, that's a good question. When I purchase the fruit, that's usually something I double check with them about before I purchase it. If it's like when we got those bags of potatoes, those were huge bags, but they had smaller bags in them. We were not allowed to open up those smaller bags, but we could give, we didn't have to give out the giant bag. Um, 
Huh? As long as they're in boxes, we can open them up. Now, if they were in bags that were tied, we would not be able to open up those bags and get them out individually. So we get them in boxes yep. that are open, and we, we count them out. Then we can count them out. Yep. Yep. That's why we're kind of careful about what we do get, okay. so we don't have to give out a 50-pound bag of something. It's like we had 50-gallon jars of peaches, those jugs of peaches. We had to give them out like that, so people got 50 gallons of peaches. Have been five, yeah. Five, yeah. They were huge. Let's be honest. They were. Um, change your gloves again. If, if for some reason we are using gloves, we change them. If they become dirty, if they get a tear, or if you're changing casts. If you get a wound, put a band aid on it. Clean it. Put a band aid on it. If it continues to bleed through the band-aid, either put another band-aid on it, and if it stops, fine, you're good. If it continues to bleed through the second band-aid, go home. <laughs> you need to go have it looked at, or you need to sit there like this until it stops bleeding. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cover it, uh, and if and if if it's just doing a little bit, and you that would be a time when you might consider putting the glove on over that, so that it does not get on if you do get a cut on your hand. Um, so that it does not get on the food. Smoking, eating, chewing gum, and tobacco. Okay, we don't have smoking on the premises, so that's not an issue. It's also, we don't do chew, chew tobacco. We don't have vaping. We don't have any of that on our premises. Um, however, drinking and eating, we need to not do that around the food. So if you have um, a cup of coffee, don't set it on the table where you're bagging. You can set it on the shelves behind. You can set it on the coolers where there's no food, or you can set it in the back room or in the office. But you can't set it next to the food. If you come with breakfast, same thing. Eat your breakfast before you come and start doing the food. The, the food needs to stay away. Your food and drink need to stay away from the food that we are working with. Um, so our designated areas are by the shelves, in the back room, um, and in the office. How about chewing gum? I always do chewing gum. I have no idea why chewing gum is on there. That's true. Asher does that too. Um, if you are a reasonable adult that can keep the gum in your mouth, you can chew the gum. Just please do not chew like a cow, is what I tell my students. Yeah, don't 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 blow bubbles. Don't pull it out of your mouth. Don't drop it out of the food, and you're probably okay. If you are sick, don't come to don't come to food bank. Well, this is common sense, yeah. but you know. Yeah, sick. vomiting, diarrhea, jaundice, sore throat. I don't want to see you. I love you. Don't want to see you. Uh, now, if you have allergies and you're sure it's allergies, that's okay. But if you feel like death, stay home. It's okay to not come because you don't feel well. Um, but we especially do not want you to come if you have something that you, that you even have, there's a remote chance that it might be contagious. Especially because we do have a lot of older um, clients, and we do not want to transmit anything to them. Um, that's very important. Temperature danger zones. Uh, so 41 to 135 degrees Fahrenheit is the danger zone. So we need to keep our food below 41 degrees. We have to have a blanket. We have a special freezer blanket that we wrap around freezer food when we get it. Even though we are only 15 minutes away from the mm -hmm. from home harvest, we have to do that, and then we have to put it straight in freezers. Um, and if it's frozen, it has to go in a freezer. If it's just a cooler item, like the fresh fruit, fruits or the vegetables, um, eggs, cheese, if it's not frozen, it can go in our coolers. Otherwise, it has to go in a freezer, and it has to remain frozen until we give it out. And um, we have to keep logs on our freezers when they are in use. We have to check them. Um, I think it's every day or every twice a week. I have to check it. Uh, okay, that's that. Temperature log for each freezer. We have to record it each. So every time we distribute food, we have to record it as long as those freezers are in use. We don't get food delivered. But if we start working with some, some grocery stores or if we do get a delivery from, say, uh, some, from some kind of donation, we just need to make sure that the vehicle is clean, that we're getting it out of, that it does not look like there's been any pests around, and that the food looks clean and is in still in good shape. 
If we don't think it's in good shape, we don't accept it. General store, okay, store food only in designated. So we store food either on the tables, on the pallets under the table, only on the pallets, and on the shelves on the pallets. That's it. We cannot put it anywhere else. We cannot store food in the back room at this time because it is dirty. We have to clean that back room out. Now we have supplies back there. We really can't store food back there. Um, and we have, it has to be six inches away from the wall, so we can't push the food all the way back up against the wall. And you can't push the food all the way against each other. You need to have air flow around the food. Um, and you see six inches off the floor, which is why we use pallets. Okay, Re uh, store ready to eat food above raw meat. We talked about this, vegetables above raw meat so that the doesn't cross-contaminate. Um, Wrap or cover food, which again, not an issue because everything we get is pretty much already covered. But if it's not, we need to cover it in some way. If it's a box without a lid, we need to just put some bags on top of it to protect it from perspiration and um, anything that might be in the freezer at that time. Um, especially because we do put different uh, different items in our fridges and freezers. We do we should put bags over the top of any fresh things that we get if they don't have a box lid or are not in bags. Handling recalled food. Knock on wood, we have not thus far gotten anything that has been recalled, but I get recall notices at least every other day, if not every day, of something that has been recalled. Um, if that comes up, we are obligated to figure out who got that recalled food and contact them to the best of our ability. We don't have to track them down, but that's why we ask for phone numbers. We do have to try and contact them. Um, and then we take, we will con we will collect all of the food and take it back to Golden Harvest, and they will hold it for disposal. But again, hopefully that never happens to us. Uh, if we are, so when we go to collect our food, we need to make sure our vehicle is clean, pest free, and that we don't put it in a vehicle that was used to haul garbage. <laughs> that one got in there twice. Uh, don't ever, and we can never leave food outside, especially near a dumpster. We don't have a dumpster, so that's not really an issue, but we never leave food outside, um, and we never, uh, if we were delivered to us, we have to make sure we're there to meet it and that it is not left outside. We cannot give out food that has been left outside. That's more of the same. Keep it refrigerated. We talked about that. That's something we are obligated to do. Um, we have to keep it at its frozen temperature. And we can't leave the food un uh, we can't go pick it up and then go do something else before we bring it and store it. We go, we pick it up, we drive home, we put we drive back to the food bank, we put it all away, store it, then you can go do whatever you want. But it cannot sit outside in a vehicle unattended. Um, with loading and transporting food, this is the exact same thing we just talked about before. So we're moving on. Don't break down food into smaller portion sizes. We don't do that. Don't wash eggs. We don't get eggs usually, but we did one time from bargains, which was lovely. But you cannot wash an egg because an egg has a protective coating on the outside, and once you wash it, no longer has that protective coating. If we do get eggs and an egg breaks, you remove the broken egg and any eggs that were contaminated by that broken egg, and then you leave the rest in that container unless the container is totally unusable. I know things you learn, right? Cleaning versus sanitizing. Cleaning removes food and other dirt from surfaces. Sanitizing reduces pathogens. Um, so that's exciting. We have to clean and sanitize our tables, anything that food touches, which is generally our tables. Uh, there's really no way to sanitize the pallet. <laughs> it's just not. Um, but we do need to clean our tables every, um, you know, every couple of times, every couple of days. And a lot of other stuff does not, this doesn't apply to us because we don't break down food. But we need to make sure that if we if we have, say with the peaches, if we have rotten peaches on the table, we need to clean that. Because um, I know some of those peaches started to rot eventually because they came up with my compost area. Um, so we need to make sure that we're cleaning all of those areas if when we have fresh, especially when we have fresh and stuff. Um, and if we're not throwing away, we should throw away any boxes that have had contaminants. We don't repackage food, so most of this is not, it doesn't apply to us. Um, 
Don't leave garbage outside. It needs to go straight to the dump. Don't leave food cans. This has got food on the floor. That all has to be cleaned up. And again, when we throw food away, we have to destroy the food. We cannot just throw it in the garbage. We should make sure our garbage clams are clean every now and then, even though we put bags in them, stuff leaks through the bags. Uh, do not clean the garbage cans inside the food bank. Yes. How are we supposed to dispose of our bank the um, at this time, we are supposed to collect all of it and open the cans and dump them and put bleach on them. So we should do that every couple of times. If somebody wants to take the food on their own, that's their decision. But the, but out of date food, we are obligated to destroy. If we throw it away, we are obligated to destroy it. I cannot speak to that, so especially not as. <laughs> yeah. We we are obligated to destroy it. That 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 is from the USDA. They don't want a homeless person getting into our dumpster, getting into food that's bad, and eating it and getting sick, which is reasonable. We don't want people to get sick from our food, um, but we have to we have to make good faith a good faith effort to destroy the food. All right, this is the next training. So this is client rights, um, creating a positive experience for your clients. And that's something we really do want to always do. Um, so why is creating a positive experience important? A client's first visit to a food pantry, soup kitchen can be confusing, intimidating, and humiliating. So it can be really hard for people to come and ask for food. And we need to we need to realize that and respect that. That for a lot of these people, it is difficult for them to come and ask. Um, that is something we encounter at the check-in table. People are constantly saying, "This is my. I, I just. I'm just going. I just need it for right now, and I wouldn't be here if it weren't for my kids or my grandkids, or you know." Um, and we just we want to reassure them that we are there to help. We are not judging them in any way. We are simply there to give them food. Um, positive experience. Clients should have privacy. This, uh, so we need to use discretion. Um, we need to keep paperwork secure. That means that's why our, bind, our binder needs to go away at the end of the day into our, into our office. Um, it's never left out and it's never left unattended when we have clients there. Um, now, when, if you're the only person working the food bank, that's a little more difficult, but you need, again, a good faith effort. Close the binder, put it on the chair, go get their food, take it out. Um, don't leave the room while they are there with the, with the other client's paperwork. That's one of the reasons why we don't let clients pull their own paperwork. We pull it for them so that it stays secure. Um, never discuss their situation without their permission, especially if they say that there's if there's something else that you want to help them with, that's wonderful, but you need to make sure you get their permission to help them with that, to, to go and involve somebody else in that. If you think that there's somebody else that can help them, that you ask them before you involve somebody else in that situation. Um, if you know they need coats, don't go over to the Methodist Church and ask them for coats for this family without asking that family first. Uh, and never speak negatively about a client, even if we have a difficult client. And some of our clients can be difficult. We, we can be honest about that. We love each and every one of them. That does not mean each and every one of them are always pleasant to interact with, but we should never speak negatively about them. We don't know what's going on with them. Just like we have bad days, they may have bad days. Uh, have a conversation. Offer refreshments if possible. We don't do that at this time, but if we were to ever get pastry, we used to get pastries in occasionally. If we did get those in, we are allowed to set those out for our clients, for our clients to have when they come if we would like to. Um, at this time, we don't really have the room. It's, it's not something we're really dealing with, but in the future, we could do that if we wanted to. Um, and we always help them out with our groceries. Offer additional resources. This is something that we're going to be working on, coming up with a good way to do that. We've got some of the food bank members are doing some research on what other additional resources are um, out in the community for them, mostly things that DSS would offer out at the um, Anderson. Our, our hope is to have an area where they can go pick up those flyers and brochures. So that's something that we are working on. And so if, if you're checking in or if you're walking out with a client and they ask you about something, we hope to have an area that you can refer them to so they can go and pull information on additional resources. <coughs> Non-discrimination, this is really important. 
no discrimination by race, sex, religion, gender, identity, sexual orientation, immigrated status, or whether they receive government assistance. Because we, because we work with USDA, they are automatically qualified to get food through us if they receive government assistance. We don't judge them by their possessions. Um, this is a really important one. This actually was brought to my attention. We had a little old man who would come in, and he doesn't come in anymore. I believe he has passed away, but he would a very nice car. Mm -hmm. And every time he come in, he would sit at my table and say, that's not my car. I borrow it. I don't want you to think I'm using you. That's my grandson's car. Um, so we don't know. Again, we just don't know their situation. So we don't want to judge them based on that. Um, and I always reassured him, didn't matter. We were there for him because we care. Never want to judge them based on their family situation. If they've got three kids, if they've got 12 kids, it does not matter if they're unmarried. None of that matters. They're there for food. We love them. We want to help and assist them. And we want to be gracious and show them love regardless. Um, if a client does not have proper paperwork for their first visit, we will give them food that, the, that we as the church have purchased. We cannot give them the USDA food. So if you have a client, if you're doing the check-in table and you have a client that is not eligible for USDA or did not have their ID or something to that effect, you need to come and call either Kathy, myself, Deborah, Aaron, Jim. One of us can go through and pull things that are non-USDA. Um, remember, no matter how your rest arrives, they're hungry. So we want to feed them. That means if they are not in Anderson, we are only able to give out food to those in Anderson County, except for the first visit. If they come from Greenville County on their first visit, we can give them food. After that, and we give them a resource to go to other food banks that are Greenville. But we can only do that on the first visit. Um, there's no such thing as pantry hopping. Clients can shop at various food pantries. So if you go to put food in someone's vehicle and they already have food there, that's fine. They are allowed to visit different food banks um, because we don't provide enough food for 30 days worth of groceries. Then there is a pantry hopper. Yeah, it's just not a bad thing. It's like going to different grocery stores. Um, so again, it's just not something we want to judge on. It's not something we want to make any comments on. It is perfectly acceptable for them to go from, from one food bank to another. And they have I'm to stay in their own county, right? They have to stay in their own county, yes. We can only give food to the people to those in Anderson County. Um, and I recently discovered the reason for that is Golden Harvest is Anderson. Harvest for Hope is Greenville. So they're two different entities that collect food. They're two different reporting agencies. Okay, so now this is more specifically us as a food bank. Um, this is what the food bank came up with. I have no idea why that is there. Okay, you're gonna this this might get a little dicey. We'll see. Um, I don't I don't know why that non-discrimination thing is there. <laughs> um, so we provide emergency food assistance, obviously, but more than that, we are a place that we live out God's call to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with, with our God. <coughs> this is one of the main ministries of the church, and that's a really important thing to remember. Um, feeding the hungry is part of living out our life and witness to Christ. Um, it's a ministry dedicated to the glory of God, and it is a place where we are called, where we can come for refreshment as well. It's a place where we can gather for fellowship and refreshment. Um, right. How is it supported? So part of the food comes from the USDA. We have no control over this. We don't get notified of what we're getting until we get there, but we will give out whatever is given. Um, some of the food is collected through food drives or donations. That's a little more rare, but um, we do get things from uh, middle school drops, does a food drive. We have gotten a little bit from the post office when they've gotten extra stuff in. Um, and we're going to be trying to up that and working with, maybe trying to start look, working with more local grocery stores and getting things, donations that way. Uh, the rest of the food is purchased from Golden Harvest or area grocery stores, mostly bargains. Um, and that money comes from the church budget. The Diamond Meal Program and other donations the food bank receives. Last year we did receive several memorial gifts, so that is one way that we get that we get funding for the food bank. Um, this year we have not taken in nearly as much as we've taken in in the past. So uh, the Diamond Meal Program is important. I'm not going to go through all the logistics of that because I'm pretty sure most of y'all know about it. Um, if we have time at the end, I'll go over it. But we're going to keep keep moving on. Non-discrimination again, civil rights compliance. 
um, in compliance with Golden Harvest Food Bank contract, the food bank must ensure that the program benefits and participants are made of it, participation is made available to all persons provided to all eligible eligible individuals without regard to their race, color, national origin, sex, or disability. USDA is an equal opportunity provider and employer. And for those with disabilities, we go to their car to assist them to come inside or occasionally just take it out to them. Um, we make reasonable efforts to uh, provide language assistance. We have translation cards for our forms that are in Russian and Spanish, and we will start having a Spanish form that they can fill out as well. Um, because we do have some Russians that come, so we do have that. Uh, Non-discrimination poster, we have to have the For Justice for All poster displayed and the income eligibility guidelines displayed. That's part of USDA. All uh, households have the right to make a complaint. If you have a client that is unhappy with how they have been served, they have the right to file a complaint against us. If that happens, contact myself or Kathy. Um, or Pastor Aaron, and we will get the appropriate forms. Um, it needs to be filed uh, within 30 days, I believe. Um, 180 days, I guess. So if you have somebody that's unhappy, you don't need to deal with them. Just come get one of us, and we will talk through with whatever the issue was. If we can make them happy and they go away, great. If they're still not happy, we will provide them with the um, correct paperwork to fill out. We hope that that never happens, but it can. Code of conduct, smile and be pleasant. Treat everyone with respect and courtesy. Be caring and understanding. Be a good listener. Offer assistance. Serve clients in a timely manner. Um, if if they're having to wait for a really long time and it's our fault, I mean, even if it's not our fault, we just you know apologize that they had to wait. It's just nice, even when we're frustrated. Uh, make clients feel appreciated. Always let them know they're welcome to come to church. Um, and if it's a slow day and you have time to chat with your client when you're checking in, Ask them if they have any prayer requests. Ask them if there's anything else they need. Get to know the clients. Um, or if you're, you know, if you're a bagger and your tables are full and you want to go wander around and talk to our clients, please do. Um, make them feel welcome. That's that's important. Jobs at the food bank. All right. So now we're getting to the nitty gritty. We have the door person, the registration table, the check-in, the table bagger, the runner. This is a new title, it's not a new job, but I've created a new title for it, the table run crew, because I uh, equate this to the backstage crew at the theater, so I'm calling them the table run crew. Box cutter and bag inspector and organizer. All important jobs. All right, so our door person hands out numbers. We start handing out numbers at 8 o'clock. We do not hand out numbers before then. That's really important because we start to have people line up outside our food bank at around 2 o'clock in the morning for no good reason, but they did. So saying that we don't hand out numbers until 8 o'clock has helped that to a degree. And then we try and hand them out every 15 minutes after that. Um, so if a client comes in and asks for a number, just ask them, just let them know we'll be out there in a few minutes and for them to go ahead and wait outside. We don't want clients grabbing their own numbers. Um, they greet people and you monitor the door so that we don't have all 45 people try and pile into the check-in table. Just keeps everyone in orderly fashion. Once the room is full and we don't have any more, just you hold people outside unless it's you know, pouring down rain, freezing cold, or blisteringly hot. Um, in that case, we have them wait in, wait in the bay next, um, next, to the, next to the loading dock door. Registration table, it checks ID every single time, checks first, last, and middle name, and pulls the client's paperwork. If they, and if they have the paperwork, we hand it to them, Client goes and sits down. If they don't have paperwork, either they're new or they haven't been here with us and we have to fill out new paperwork, they should just wait and we will fill out the paperwork for them. Which takes us to the check-in table. So, excuse me, they check the clients in so they can receive the food. This is the check-in policy. And if anyone wants to be trained on this table specifically, um, I'm going to go through it fast now, but if we do need, we especially need some people to be trained on this. Um, so, the check-in process, you always check ID. Always, even if we know the person, I always ask for ID from everybody, no matter what. Every person has to have it. Um, if they have a form, we ask them to sign the sheet, the sign-in sheet, and they need to, you need to make sure after they signed it that they filled out it all the way across. Oftentimes, they'll leave the number of people in their family blank, the um, 18 and under, 16 and over, and all that information is on their check-in sheet. So after your client has gotten up from your table, just check your sign-in sheet real quick and fill that information in for them. Um, 
make sure that what uh, we always ask them if anything has changed the last visit or you can ask them to just look over their form again to make sure that it is still correct and then you have them sign and date the back you fill out the card for the runners and you ask clients if there's anything else they need refer them to um, our other information of other services available again if you have time ask them if they have a prayer request talk with them find out what's going on in their lives um, if they don't have a form, we fill one out for them. We fill out, uh, we use their ID to fill it out, and it has to appear exactly as it appears on their ID. First, it's last name, first name, middle name. We want their full name on there because we have a lot of clients that have the same name, and often, and we even have clients same that have the first same first and last name. So you have to have their full name. You can, in parentheses, put a name that they prefer to be called by at the very end. Uh, but that cannot be the that does not take the place of their full legal name. Uh, make sure that they live in Anderson County, and then you check the income eligibility guidelines. Um, we just make sure that either they receive government assistance. If they do, they're automatically qualified, and if not, we check we find out what their income is and make sure that they're qualified that way. They review the form and they sign it <coughs> back. So this is the USDA form. Name, address, we ask them what their what racial ethnicity they identify with, read them the options, and have them verbally tell you what they, what they identify with. Um, if they receive food stamps, family independence, and social, it's not Social Security. This is, um, this is um, yes, I have to go check it out. It's, um, it's not disability either. It's it's a. I'll, I will find out what that is and put it on our check-in table because I, I have it written down. I just can't remember. I'll put my right now. If they get one of these three things, we all we always still write down the number in the household just because that that's an inform, piece of information we need. But we do not have to ask their income. If they do not, we ask their income, and their income must meet the income eligibility guidelines. It can be a dollar under it. They can look at the guidelines. We do not ask them for any proof of what they make. We are not allowed. The only thing we're allowed to ask for is ID and proof of residency. Um, if their ID, if their address is different from their what's on their ID, we need to ask them to bring something with their correct address the next time they come in. Uh, mailing address, telephone number, again, if they have one, that's important if we have a recall. And then we write down the ages. They don't. Ha they do not have to give us this information. So we always ask them if they would like to. It's helpful for us to know so we can fill out paperwork properly. But they do not have to give it to us. They sign. They date. If they want to put anybody to pick, if they want to list two people to pick up their food for them, they do. And then they sign yeah. and date the back. You have them print those names. Yeah, it's a lot. In yeah. Um, all right, now, if they do not qualify for USDA food, but they do live in Anderson County and they're going to keep coming to the food bank, they must fill out this application instead. This is new. Name, date of birth, uh, street address, phone number, number in the household, and then we're going to list their names and, and ages. Uh, and they sign and date it, and they sign and date at the bottom, and then again they sign and date on the back. This, if we, there's two times they would fill this out. If we, if they do not, if they're not eligible for USDA, or if we run out of USDA. So we may end up having people with both forms. And we're going to have to keep straight. Are they getting USDA today, or are they not? Hopefully that's not something we're going to encounter. It's one of the reasons why we give out USDA every single time they come in. But if we run out of USDA at the end of the month, they will have to fill out the non-USDA form because they are not receiving USDA at that time. We'll then staple the two forms together, and when they come in, we'll have them sign whichever form, and the next time they come in, whichever form applies. If they're getting USDA that time, they sign that one. If they're not, then they sign again. Clear as mud? All right, table bagger. This is probably the one most of you are familiar with. Um, so we break the table. Every table goes protein, vegetable, vegetable, fruit, grain, one per. Every table has, we try and do three slots on every table. Every slot has, we, and we do a sign. Every slot, we try and have 192 or 240 items in that slot. So slot one might have 100 chicken and 90 tuna. So the first thing you would use in that slot is chicken. The second thing, once the chicken runs out, you would go to the tuna. 
your bag would have some compilation of all of these of, of these items. So that something from slot one, something from slot two, something from slot three in order. It's just to keep our inventory straight. Often things will go will start bagging so fast and so we'll end up with we might end up with three beans and uh, at the end because the beans somehow got missed. And that's okay, it's not the end of the world. But we try and give out everything. It is first come, first serve. So we do need to try our best to, to make sure that things go out in the order that they are listed. Um, and that's why we put things like frozen meat will always go out first because that's the best item. So first come is going to get the best that we have. Does that make sense how that works? Okay. Um, once the last item on, in a slot is gone, that slot is empty. So if we don't have a full slot on a table, you may end up with only two items. <laughs> At that point, we will reassess and see if there's something else we can put in there. Should we pull two of another item? But generally speaking, the slot's just empty and they get two items, and that's fine. Um, everything, each, each slot is one per bag unless it says otherwise. And then all items have to be inventoried at the end of the day, but please wait until the uh, end of the day to actually inventory. Um, or you're going to be doing a lot of subtracting for those 10 people that come in the last five minutes of food bank. <laughs> runners. So we do try and pair runners up based on experience um, or ability level. Each runner receives a card from the check-in table. It has the full name of the person, and it has the numbers, either 1-1, one, 1-2, one, one, two, or 2-2. Two, two. The first number is the protein table. The second number refers to the next four tables because the last table is always the one per table. Um, so if you had a 1-1, one, one, you would pick up one bag from every table. If you have a 1-2, you'd pick up one bag from the protein. Two from one vegetable table, two from the next vegetable table, two from the fruit table, two from the grain table, and one from the one per table. You have a two-two, you pick up two bags from everything until you get to the one per table, and then, as the name suggests, you pick up one. Um, pretty, pretty easy and straightforward, but it does get heavy. Uh, box cutters. So they um, are picking up our boxes and cutting them down so we can take them for recycling keeping our area clean and that, and they will load all the boxes into the truck at the end of the day. Table run crew. So this is just, I just needed the title for this, and this is the title that I came up with. Um, so this person or people are behind the scenes making sure that our tables are always stocked. They're lifting things up from the floor and putting them on the tables or getting them off the shelves. Um, they're picking up empty boxes, taking them to the box cutter. They might grab bags and take them out to the table. Um, they're just helping to keep everything flowing and organizing behind the scenes. Uh, if you have a question about what goes on the table next and you're in this position, you can talk to Kathy or myself. If, you're, if you are the bagger and you have a question, you can ask the table run crew person what, is on, what goes on the table next because I we try to go through with them every table so they know what's happening. Um, but if you ever have a question, Kathy or myself are usually the ones to come to. Is that clear as mud? And again, we would like more people to volunteer for this position as well. This is one of the things Jim has taken on and has been sort of dubbed the table run crew person. But we are more than willing to have more people do this job. Mm -hmm. um, end of the day cleanup, everything has to be inventory. Anything, uh, and make sure, if you have items on your table, make sure there aren't more on the shelves. I, I try and make notes on the, on the table cards. But sometimes I have a two-year-old and don't have time to do it and don't and forget to do it. So do check the shelves and make sure that there's not more of your item on the shelf. You write your inventory number down on the card, and then I, we, somebody will enter it into the inventory book. We load the box, the truck with all the boxes and the garbage. We take down our open sign and all of our cones. And we're done. Monday and Tuesday run basically the same, just on a smaller scale, and we don't have all of the jobs. Um, but if you have time on Monday or Tuesday to come help, please do. Thursday, the, the Thursday before the third Saturday, um, generally it's been about 2 o'clock. We need help setting everything up. Um, final thoughts. Clothing drives. So we are conducting two or occasionally three clothing drives throughout the year. We collect the clothing. We take it to, currently it's the Methodist um, thrift store, thank you, I'm getting a little punchy, uh, Methodist thrift store, and they give us vouchers that we can then give out to our clients that they can use there. Um, and we'll give those vouchers out um, the Saturday. We'll probably give them out, actually, November this year so they have time to use it for Christmas, because last time, uh, if we wait till December, then they only have, like, a day. Um, and then there's, like, 150 people trying to go to the Methodist thrift store that day. 
Um, mm. If you ever have any questions or concerns, you don't. If you think you have a better way to run something, please tell us. Please talk to us. It may be a conversation that ends with me saying thank you so much. We're going to keep doing it this way, or I might go, oh my gosh, that's the most brilliant thing I've ever heard. That's wonderful. We're totally going to try it. Or I might say, hey, we're going to try it for once, and if it works, great. We'll incorporate it, and if it doesn't work, then we've tried it, and that's great too. But please do talk to us. Um, we, we try and do our best to be an open door. Kathy is the co-chair, um, so we are the two people to talk to. Um, and if you have any ideas on anything else you think the Food Bank Committee should be doing or the anything, please talk with us or somebody else on the Food Bank Committee. All right. Um, I have no idea what time it is. Probably. Yes. Um, so does anybody not know about the Diamond Meal Food Challenge that wants me to go through this? So otherwise, I'll just be done. Um, okay. Does anybody have any questions? Is there anything I missed? Anything thrilling why, that you need to know about? Why are we being uh, uh, out of foot with two forms? Because uh, USDA. Um, because USDA only wants their form to be used for USDA food because that form is specific to USDA. And that program is only used by a certain number of food banks. And so we can only use it for, the real answer is, I don't know, it seems silly to me too. But the answer I was given was that is a USDA form, it has to be, we can only use it for USDA people. Um, and it's just not something we have been super good about doing, but we really have to be at, uh, at this point. We've gotta be better about, about doing that, so we will make sure to have those forms at the check-in table to use for both. Um, especially if we run out of USDA food. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Anything else? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Time out. Time out. Um, anything else? Any any other questions or concerns or comments? I don't know. Did I misspell some? This is like from three years ago. I just pulled this one. Each month. Oh, that's old. I'm sorry. I should have deleted that. It's helpful to have all items by the third Thursday so it's ready for the Saturday, for Saturday distribution. Disruption. <laughs> Disruption. <laughs> this is from 2014. I didn't even reread it. <laughs> There's certain things spell check does not catch. If you use the wrong word, they don't tell you. Uh, one thing, Louise, that was mentioned when you and I went to training is that um, they may send a secret shopper yeah. um, to come around who says, This is my first time, I, need, you know, I, I don't have paperwork, and just Put whoever's at the door um, to the test to see if you know what questions to ask and yeah. if you're polite or you say, "Well, I'm sorry, you gotta leave." <laughs> but um, they really they did never say. They really did say that. <laughs> yes, that they did say they were going to be sending people to make sure that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. And we've already had our paperwork audited. Uh, and they are doing that every year now. So that's another reason why we're trying to be better. That's why I've got to make sure that each one of you sign that sheet that comes around that I have trained you. So if it got stopped somewhere, keep the sheets need to keep going. Um, yeah, yeah, signed over and they do flip through our book and they make sure that it that looks like the when they're picking up food that that is matching with when we're giving out um, with with the sign in sheets. They did compare sign in sheets to check in sheets. Um, they checked and they checked our pest control logs and they checked our temperature logs and they looked around the building to make sure that it's clean. And they're going to be doing that probably sometime in the next month or so. We'll uh, we'll get audited again. And that's going to be in every month and every year's so or more than once a year. Um, did we pass? Uh, we did pass. We did have some write ups. The big thing is we need to get a sign out front that says, and this is actually from last year, so this will come up again this year. Um, we need to get a sign out front that has our dates and times that people can see from the road. Whereas we've been waiting on that with the name change and everything, but that's something we, ha we have to do. Um, and the Food Bank Committee has authorized um, that to start happening. So we're putting aside money to get that settled. Um, 
and we didn't have all of our pest control paperwork at the time, so that was another another ding against us that we're trying to be better about collecting our pest control paperwork every time he comes in and checks it. So. They say what kind of sanitizer you need to use? They did not specify. No, and they don't specify what you have to use as far as pest control, and it does not have to be a company. We use a company. We just have to document it. Um, so um, I don't know what we, use, what we use to clean, but Jam, Jam Pro, Pro Jam, too. No. Button. Anything else? Everybody's clear on when to wash their hands? One thing, we're, we're preaching to fire here because this is the core group everybody worked so hard to make it done, but we need to all make an effort to reach out to our other members and make them aware of the importance of this ministry and the commitment that we all made to the ministry and to get everybody to participate. Everybody in this church thinks if you ever did something once, you're down for life. You need to make it clear that you don't have to be there. We're, we're trying to change you're that. Not? We're trying to say, come when you can. <laughs> uh, and, and to speak to that, we have uh, food bank members have all taken on a couple of people from the church to call and ask them to come and help and to remind them um, when a food bank is coming up and to get more people to sign up. So you may get a call from one of us on the committee saying, hey, are you coming this Saturday? Which Saturdays do you want to help? Um, I don't know is that our core group all made it onto that list because we know y'all are going to be there most of the time um, but for the most part we're going to be calling and making sure that we have because we have actually this summer just barely squeaked by with the number of volunteers and we've had people covering more than one table and we really we really hurt for runners during the summer um, during the school year because we partner with our ROTC we're a little bit better but uh, on our high volume months even then that's a little bit tough so yeah, we really, and it's the main ministry of the church, so that's another reason we really, if you're a church member, we want you to be involved. Mm -hmm. It is fun. I think it's fun. We have a good time. I laugh. I laugh most of the time. I cry a little bit when I have to chase after him, but you know. We want to get to those church Yeah, we do have a fair amount of downtime. And anything else? Do you have anything you need to say? Um, just some quick announcements. Um, I do have, I mentioned uh, Belton's All Day Vacation Bible School. It's this Saturday and it includes adults. So actually, the flyer they sent me, it's, it's hey, guess what? We have adults. Also, there's youth in the children. You know. um, but if you want some of those, go ahead and, and, and grab them. They're doing some, it's Rio. 2016 they have a missionary from Rio who's going to be speaking um, so some some good stuff with that and uh, I think that's it we're good right now so no no but I will I am going to be teaching at this same one that I did on last time all right well, let's. This is <laughs> Belton. That table wasn't one Saturday. <laughs> that table I should sit at. Starts at nine thirty. Okay, I'll, I'll talk to you later. I'll talk to you. Later. All right. Let's 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 close in prayer. Lord God, thank you so much for the opportunity that this little church has to serve so many people. Thank you for this ministry that you have grown out of just mutual love between two churches. And now has grown into a full-fledged ministry. Thank you for all of the help we get and the rules that we get and the things that we need to do. Help us to be mindful that they are to serve your people correctly. Thank you for Louise and Kathy and the food bank team. It does so much work in all these 
volunteers. Bless us as we go out this year, serve your people and feed to be your hands and feet. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.